Kyle Meredith, this right here is the one and only Ben Soli. Welcome back, sir. Good to see you again. Third time on the show. Nice to have you around. That's the most, right? That's the most. You're the winner. You got on here more than anyone. Half Made Man is a new record. I've been loving, loving this record. Uh, before the record, though, you, the whole setup of this was kind of interesting because you crowdsourced the entire thing. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't go with a record label for this one. Uh, you have a song on it called DIY. Mm -hmm. You have a line in Get Off Your Knees. Saying there ain't nobody coming. Yeah. It's like you went through this one alone. Like you were, you were kind of, you know, machete and everything, just cutting down the weeds yourself. Yeah, I was fortunate in this one to have a lot of, lot of fan support, and you know, it takes a group of good people to help an artist mm -hmm. get out there. It really does take a village. But you know, I didn't go with a record label or um, anything like that because I, all it takes these days is a direct relationship with your audience. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. And sometimes record labels and other business interests can just get in the way of that. I mean, that's why we do all the things that we do with the bike tours and all the social activism, mm -hmm. because we're trying to tell a story and connect with other people's story. Right, right. And funding the record through audience support and crowdsourcing was totally available and, and made sense for this project. Yeah. Did you ever feel like you owed them something? Uh, the audience, because you don't see them, you know, they're, they're not there, they're not in the studio mm -hmm. with you, but they're the ones like digging into their pockets to give you the money. Yeah, I mean, we certainly, the industry's always been based on audience support. Mm -hmm. It's just in the past, it's been developed and kind of curated by labels. And now it's the job, there's a new relationship in place. It's the artist and the audience. And it's kind of a new relationship. It's somewhat mm -hmm. awkward. It's like it's like a like a high school relationship or something. You really kind of there's all those awkward moments where you ask too much of the person or they ask too much of you and you're just kind of like you accidentally touch each other in the hallway. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, ooh. sorry. <laughs> and so it's it's one of those things that's got to mature and grow. Right. And I think as it does, it'll settle into yeah. um, what might become a model mm. for musicians. Well, let's talk about this record, Half Made Man. Mm -hmm. My first thought when I hear it is, first off, how big the sound is of this. It's a very big sound. But the second one is, it doesn't feel like a cello record. Like, mm -hmm. like it's a, kind of been, you know, your, th your thing in the past. The cello was, uh, it always felt, you know, very much there. And this is, is a big sound. The drums are big. The other instruments are big. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, and it's you uh, yeah. on the forefront. It is always interesting how people perceive what you are as an artist. And a lot of times people really focus in on the cello and the singing. Right. And I think for me, I think that I view myself more as a storyteller or songwriter mm -hmm. who happens to play a cello because it's a super versatile instrument. And um, so for all my records, it's always been a part of the sound, but never the sound. Mm -hmm. Maybe one day I'll make a, a record that is about that sound. Um, so. But would it make a difference now since people already think, you know, cello been so lead? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. You know, I think that this record for me was about storytelling mm -hmm. and it was about um, kind of self portraits. Each song's its own portrait of a piece or a part of me or who I think I might be yeah. or what I think others think of me. All those sorts of things. It's called Half Made Man. The, the vision is that I'm not quite finished growing or figuring out who I am yet. And other people aren't finished figuring out who I am yet. Yeah. So um, in this way, I sat down with all these musicians in the studio and we kind of tried to give raw performances of these portraits. Yeah. I like so. to get into those portraits too because it seems every one of your records, um, and I have the benefit of, of knowing you uh, outside of this interview, but um, it, they, they've always seemed very autobiographical. Mm -hmm. Like all of your records, like if you want to know the personal life of Ben So Lee, to study those lyrics pretty hard, well, you, you might find some stuff out. Life, so you could kind of I, I could put it together, things. sure. Yeah, but, yeah. but you know, you're, you, that does, you know, uh, as far as your storytelling, it does seem very personal. Mm -hmm. You know, so what are those portraits this time? I mean, I I is this a strictly autobiographical record? 
Uh, or are you even writing in character at any points? Uh, certainly. I mean, you did it a little bit on the last one. Like, I, I can look at the globe. Uh -huh. And that's, that's obviously, that's not, not exactly you. You know, that's, that's a concept. Exactly. So the, the best way, I think, to frame it is that there are different perspectives of my biography. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, there's, there's the side of me that's always wanting to fix things. So I kind of separate that character out and write about it. And his name's Asa, the healer. And he always, he's just constantly searching for this thing. Right. What, what, what you're looking for is the refrain in the song. It's like uh, constantly trying to fix it or find the way out or the solution. And that's, there's that part of me. And then there's the other side of me that is like, that wants to just like bust through the walls and be a rebel and all that stuff. Sure. And then there's the more moderated side of me that wants... And that, sorry, the bust through the walls comes out in the song Get Off Your Knees. But mm -hmm. then there's the more like moderated side of me that wants to dedicate my life to a simple art form, you know? Right. Being the maestro. That song kind of embodies that. Mm -hmm. So it's all these different self portraits that, that come out and they're all based in you know, profoundly personal moments. And mm -hmm. I think that's what connects with at least my audience and hopefully a broader audience, is that it is a genuine expression of a human experience. It's not me trying to figure out what they might buy right. or create a hit or a hook. It's just writing musically about something that happened personally to me because I think that's the best shot at creating a, a, something that connects universally is because we're all experiencing these things on a one-to-one -one basis and mm -hmm. trying to create that in a relatable musical realm is, is is my artistic challenge. Yeah. I've asked this of artists before, but uh, as you use songwriting to, to find you know, parts of yourself, you play these songs out every single night, time after time after time. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like they, they help you? Do you arrive at, do, have you ever actually completed the journey through song? Um, yeah, I think so. But it's interesting because as you play them out, the songs that had the meaning that was their birth, mm -hmm kind of start collecting meanings, even more meanings as you're out playing them. Mm -hmm. You know, as you play them for the people that are part of that song, as you play them for different audiences that sing along, those memories and experiences start to kind of accrete on the song. And so it's always growing right. in what it relates to. But you know, there are some songs like Prettiest Tree that I think I've worked my way fairly through. You know, the words, you don't quite know what they mean when you write them but they resonate with you. And so I've, I've kind of worked my way through some of them. Yeah. Almost every one of your albums, you've kind of worked with a producer, but for the most part, and this comes back to the DIY, you've done it yourself. Uh, is that still, a, I mean, we, that's a collaboration, I guess. Mm -hmm. you, know, you worked with Kevin Ratterman uh, this time around quite a bit. You've worked with Dwayne Lundy in the past. Right. Uh, you've told me personally that you have all these great idols that you would love to work with as a producer. But could you could you give up that freedom now that you're Four, four albums in, five albums in, to where you could say, yeah, you produce this, I just want to be the artist. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, and I, and I think for the most part, collaborating in the studio has always been about finding somebody who's a real wizard mm -hmm. with the instrument of the studio, the kind of collective instrument of the studio, um, and then bringing in great musicians. And for this record, yes, it's self-produced, but that's kind of because it wasn't totally legit for me to say that everybody produced it. Sure. I mean, what happened is we got these great musicians, Carl Bommel from My Morning Jacket, Jeremy Kittle, who's national Scottish fiddling champion slash played viola for the Turtle Island String Quartet, um, Jordan Ellis, my percussionist, um, and Alana Rocklin, who sat in with SDS9, has played tons of hip hop records and everything else, and we brought all these people in. They're distinct musical characters, and we all just sat down and worked our way through the arrangements mm -hmm. together. So when I listen to the record, I hear their voices and their presence, and that makes it far more interesting for me to listen to. Yeah. Because it, it was a collaborative process. We just sat down and recorded this thing over two weeks, pretty much live to tape. This is awesome. Yeah. yeah. The other side of Ben Soli, uh, you do champion quite a bit of causes. Uh, you've talked about a lot in the past uh, with the mountaintop removal, uh, biking, you know, uh, which it goes into, um, I'm sure there's a lot of things that it kind of gets into, but you know. Did we talk about them all? <laughs> just, I believe I can see a lot of interviews okay, where you've okay. talked about them all. Sorry. No, but what I'm getting at here is, has it ever been an issue, and, and I've never observed that it is, but has it ever been an issue where, you know, where the, the causes that you stand for start to overshadow the music? 
you know, because you always you tie these into your records. You write about these causes too. Mm -hmm. These are part of your lyrics. Um, that's a really good question, and it's one that would probably be asked good to ask the audience because mm -hmm. I'm not going to be so sure. For me, there's not. I don't necessarily separate them. It's not like I've got a hit song and I invite some people to come speak before and after it or just put images of a disaster with it mm -hmm. to try to raise awareness. These songs are about things that I care about that are from my soul and so it's always there. There's never, I'm never taking turns with the issues in the music and then like one takes more, gets more attention than the other. Mm -hmm. The only time that nearly happened was all the Dear Kanye stuff where I got, I got pissed off about, you know, mm -hmm. An artist who I respect a lot as an as an artist, yeah. who has got so much potential to, um, has got so much energy and power to command, influencing younger folks, and doesn't respect that, and right. just once it goes all over the place. So I wrote a song about it, sent it to my manager at the time just mm -hmm. for a fun treat, and it went all over the went place. Viral. And there was pictures of me and Kanye facing <laughs> off on the Chicagoist. And there was like, it was this insane folk versus hip hop yeah. weirdness. And um, it just completely got out of control. Right. You know, the unfortunate thing is, that's a really good song. I like the song. <laughs> it's just, it, it, it complete, it ended up performing the complete opposite thing that I wanted to do. Sure. I didn't want to give him more attention for behavior that I saw as less than accepted. It's the power of songwriting. I guess so. It's the power of a good song. I guess so. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, you've been involved in this entire time too is, is uh, modern movement and dance mm -hmm. and you incorporate that. Do you still incorporate that? Are you still, do you still work with that? I do a lot. I, yeah. I love... So what is it about that? What, what is it about dance and, and movement? Because I, I think it's, you should, it really should be called movement more than dance because of what's going on. Right. I think it's, it's, it's pretty simple to illustrate. If I talk to you like this, mm -hmm. I'm just not. I'm just not happy. If I talk, are to you me making money like, from my slump demeanor here? If I if I talk <laughs> to you like this, I'm just totally comfortable with mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And dance has that way of communicating so directly to something that we're so in tune with, with our bodies. And um, often that directness can um, keep the audience from understanding the craftsmanship behind the dance. They're like, oh, if I could move like that and communicate that too. No, they have crafted their bodies to be able to do that. And so as an art form, I think it's underappreciated. Mm -hmm. which, and so I want to help support it. But I also feel like it's our best shot at international communication about things. Because my songs with lyrics might communicate an emotion, but it can get lost and miffed and interpretation and all these things. And yes, there's interpretation to dance, but it's very resonant human to human. So one human watching another human move and express themselves can glean so much from just two seconds of movement mm -hmm. versus two seconds of a song, which can kind of hint at an emotion. Two seconds of dance and you're there. So what you're saying is we should have done this entire interview while dancing. I think we should do the continued part of this interview <laughs> while dancing. This goes back to our prom, a uh, little prom date, right? That's correct. <clears throat> you can do this. You've got to look at these lines. I have. I have. I did dance for two years. You did. I did. Yeah, that's I nice. Did. I did. <laughs> I don't know what to do about that. Um, I'm gonna let you continue on that, Ben Zoli. It has been fantastic. Half Made Man is the new record. Thank you very much. We'll see you in another month when we do this again. <laughs> how do you? How do you? How do you shake hands on this? That's it, right there. That's, that's right. it. All right. All right. We got all in there. Feeling young today, flat out and feel it's on the highway. Don't tell me to slow down, you see I grew up this way. TV shows and highlights, don't forget play by play. Now it's my turn. Feeling tough today, I'm bristled. Like a tidal wave Sweeping through the city Looking for a place to hide away All I need is someone But you left yesterday I guess it's mine